art. Art has been used to tell stories, express emotions, and show messages for eons at this point. From ancient cave art to confusing and modern sculptures, everyone on Earth has seen art. It impacts us all and makes us feel emotions and takes us into deep thought. Some art is universally recognizable and praised, but some art is left behind in the annals of history to be lost forever in obscurity. Above all, one thing that has intrigued humans for years now is the macabre, disturbing, gory, and terrifying. Why do you think things like freak shows were extremely popular? And now we have shock sites. Now you blend the macabre and art. That's what we're looking at today. We're looking at stuff from the experience of Alzheimer's, Nazi experiments, and the uncanniness of AI art. I personally really enjoy this kind of stuff. I think this stuff is cool. So in this video, I'm going over the context behind the work of art, the meaning, and why it's terrifying, for me at least. Please note that I am not an art expert nor historian. I'm just some guy looking at this stuff. This video is meant to show what I think is cool and point people in directions for this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, a disclaimer, this video has graphic works of art, but no real gore, and we do deal with some very heavy topics. If you are sensitive to this stuff, I suggest you leave now. This is your warning. Born as a descendant of German immigrants, William Uttermullen was born on December 5, 1933 in southern Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There in southern Philadelphia, during the time where William was born, racial tension was spread throughout the city which led him to be sheltered by his parents. This probably had an impact on his artistic creativity. In 1951, William received a scholarship at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, where he studied under Walter Stumpfig. Sometime after that, he joined the U.S. military where he was stationed in the Caribbean. In that, he received a GI Bill of Rights, which allowed him to further study in Europe, and where he was influenced by art in France, Italy, and Spain. He eventually moved to England where he met his wife, an art historian by the name of Patricia Redmond. His art style was influenced by Giotto Nicholas Pawson, which led his style to be, quote, exuberant at times and sometimes surrealistic. There is a sort of cycle in his art that has been described in six stages. Mythological, cantos, mummers, wars, nudes, and conversation. Some of these cycles were based upon such things as Dante's Inferno or the Vietnam War. While working on his conversation pieces be between 1989 and 1991, William started experiencing memory loss. His symptoms included struggling to read the time, forgetting his way back to his apartment, and not remembering how to do his tie, and other things. In 1995, he went to his doctor where he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and sent to Queen Square Hospital. There, nurse Ron Isaacs asked William to draw self-portraits of himself. From then onward, William began deteriorating more and more, and his art captured that. The following portraits are from 1995 to 2001. 2001 was the year he could no longer sketch.
William was admitted to a nursing home in 2004, where he died three years later of pneumonia in 2007. His wife has stated that he really was dead long before that. Bill died in 2000, when the disease meant he was no longer able to draw. Otto Dix was born on the 2nd of December in 1891 in the German city of Udermas. He was influenced by art from a young age from his mother who had written poetry earlier in her life. And his cousin, painter Fritz Eamon, who let Otto spend time in his studio. This fueled Otto's ambition to become a painter. Anywhere between 1906 and 1910, Otto was the apprentice of artist Carl Senth and began painting landscapes. On July 28, 1914, the war to end all wars, World War I, began. Some considered this war to be the first modern war, with the introduction of aircraft, machine guns, tanks, and chemical weapons introduced on a wide scale. This meant Otto volunteered to join the German army in the fall of 1915, where he was assigned as an NCO for a machine gun unit stationed at the Western Front and took part in the Battle of Somme. After that, he was then moved to the Eastern Front against Russia, but he was moved back to the Western Front again after Russia and Germany made a peace agreement. Serving in the Spring Offensive, Otto was almost killed by an injury in his neck and was hospitalized. Later after he recovered, Otto tried to join in anti-aircraft operations, but he was discharged in 1918. During the entire war, Otto kept a diary and sketchbook detailing the horrific events he experienced. The conflict deeply affected him, and his art shows that. Out of this, a 50-piece series of drawings was put out known as War. In his depictions, Otto presents terrible details of the war. Decaying bodies, dying men, men in trenches, weary troops, mad women, drunk men in bars, skin grass, fields of corpses, civilians about to be bombed, and so much more. All of these engravings would eventually lead his art to be censored by the Third Reich during World War II because of it being anti-German. Otto Dix would die in 1969 after suffering a stroke. In 1991, on the 100th anniversary of Otto's birth, the Otto Dix house was opened, reserving his war art and post-war art. He wasn't a soldier, he was one victim among tens of millions of others. Recently, AI-generated art has been popping off on the internet with the introduction of Dolly Mini. With this, there are no limits, so of course I asked it to make disturbing things. But before I show you the horrors it made, let me tell you how it works and a little bit of its history. 
There are many mechanisms for creating AI art, including procedural, rule-based generation of images using mathematical patterns and algorithms which simulate brushstrokes and other pan effects, and artificial intelligence or deep learning algorithms such as generative adversarial networks and transformers. Harold Cohan created AARON in the 1960s, which was basically a program that could create digital images. That served as a basis for what would lead programmers to use GANs to make images. Since then, it led to such programs to release such as Dolly Mini, Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, and so much more. Even with all of the development of AIs, they aren't exactly perfect, but they can be used to our advantage to create off-putting art. There's a recent video put out by Nexpo that covers a disturbing mystery about some random woman's face appearing in random prompts. So, with that out of the way, let's begin. I was originally going to use a stable diffusion demo for this, but decided on using Dolly Mini because it seems to have no boundaries when it comes to things like this. The first prompt I typed in was the most disturbing image. What I got was a bunch of blurry photo collages depicting what seemed to be unusually uncanny faces for an AI. Maybe it is better we don't see these things in greater detail. Next I used the creepiest thing, pretty much using a similar prompt. This time, I got a bunch of empty and horrific faces coming out of a dark background and not much else. So there exists a bunch of photos dating to World War I of the horrific facial injuries of troops wounded in combat. You'll see soldiers with their skin barely sticking to their face, or entire chunks blown out of some random guy's head. So the AI did this. More scary due to it being uncanny this time. Eternal damnation is a topic I will cover later in this video, so I decided to look up real photos of hell. This wasn't as bad as the others, but still you'll see what I can see like as a mass of bodies or something like that. The uncanny valley is what makes AI so disturbing. So as you do, I asked it to make the most uncanny face. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but mostly what we got was a bunch of simple faces with blank stares. These faces are more canny than everything else I asked it to make. Michelangelo is probably the most well-known artist of all time. He was born on March 6, 1475 near Erzo. It was said that Michelangelo never really was interested in school. Instead, he preferred to watch painters near churches and draw them. His father saw this and decided to send the young Michelangelo as an apprentice of an extremely influential artist in Florence. From this, potentially one of his first paintings, titled The Torment of St. Anthony, was produced. It was a painted version of an engraving made by a German artist. The scene it depicts is the legend of the temptation of St. Anthony. St. Anthony, also known as Anthony the Great, was born somewhere in the 3rd century AD, and he existed as a Christian monk. According to legend, Anthony was in an abandoned tomb for whatever reason when a bunch of demons attacked him. He was nearly killed, but by divine intervention, one of Anthony's friends found him wounded and carried him to a nearby village. Once he was at the village, Anthony wanted to return to the tomb. One of his biographers wrote about this supposed experience, saying, The demons made such a racket that the whole place was shaking knocking over the four walls of the tomb. They came in droves, taking the form of all kinds of monstrous beasts and hideous reptiles. 
and the whole place was filled with lions, bears, leopards, bulls, wolves, asps, and scorpions. Due to this, St. Anthony laughed at the demon, saying that God has taken away your power, you don't scare me, and my weapon is my faith in God. Then a bright light of God flooded into the tomb and saved St. Anthony from his torment. So, this is what the painting depicts, a bunch of surreal looking demons tormenting the saint. The demons you see are all grabbing a hold of St. Anthony, some are composed of rags, bits and pieces of a fish, one has a mouth with a stingray, another looks like it has pieces of seaweed for wings, and one has a face for a butt. The top two have sticks to beat Anthony with. To get colors for the demons, Michelangelo took to his local fish market. Overall, a terrifying and surreal depiction of demons beating some dude. Scottish artist Ken Curry was born in North Shields, England in 1960. He studied at the Glasgow School of Art and graduated in 1983. In his early works in the 80s, he painted romanticized versions of dock workers, store owners, and other people as a political response to some Margaret Thatcher policies. In 1987, he was commissioned to create a mural as a memorial to the Colton Weaver massacres. Curry's artwork usually centers around grotesque images of how injury, illness, and decomposition affects the human body. But sometimes he deviates into some political messages, so I'm not really touching that. So originally for this entry, I was going to cover one of his paintings titled Hiroshima Smile, but I found so much more that intrigued my interest. Tragic form depicts two fishermen with the carcass of a dead stingray suspended in the air with its underside slid open revealing its internal organs. It's supposed to show the bridge of human existence and an existential state. The fish is like a physical manifestation of suffering and the two men below with a knife and a fishing pole may show that they are responsible for this. Alright, I'm just going to add this. Something about a stingray's mouth has always unnerved me for whatever reason. I really don't know why. Unfamiliar Reflections is a self-portrait of Ken Curry. In it, he has to recognize and come to terms with his morality via his aging body depicted. This painting comes in tandem with Curry's father's death, which occurred before the painting's finished. You see blood dripping down from the frame of the mirror. A symbol for death. Rembrandt's carcass is an etched version of Rembrandt's slaughtered ox. Painted in 1655 as a still life, it served as an inspiration for a curry and Francis Bacon. Kraken House is a scene from either a poorly run World War I hospital, caring for troops injured in battle, or a depiction of Nazi human experiments from the Third Reich. In it, you see a man with a female body getting checked up on by a doctor. The scissors in the doctor's pocket may indicate that he may be experimenting on the man. To the left, you see a man with a prosthetic arm cutting meat. And off to the right, you see a man carrying a malnutrition body to dispose of it. In the background, you see a nurse leading two injured soldiers in a musical performance. And at the center of it all, you see a man on an operating table with a tube in its mouth that leads all the way around the scene and ends up in its groin, probably being fed his own waste. Hiroshima Smile shows us a portrait of a man who has a heavily disfigured face with displaced eyes and a missing upper jaw. As the title suggests, this guy probably nearly died from the atomic bomb dropped on 
Hiroshima towards the end of World War II. But behind all of this disturbing imagery, there is some hope. The man tries to smile with his broken face and has a cheerful look in his eyes. A nice change of pace for the rest of the paintings. So this is like a sequel or expansion on Hiroshima Smile. This time, the man has a face of shock and terror in his face. Before him stands a high-ranking military commander with his back towards us. This painting seems to show the result of a nuclear conflict to war pigs who facilitate the use of atomic bombs. Auschwitz Birkow was the most infamous of the Nazi death camps during the Holocaust. When anti-Semitic Adolf Hitler became Chancellor or Dictator of Germany, he instituted an operation named the Final Solution to rid the world of not only Jews but gypsies, homosexuals, and the physically and mentally disabled. To do this, Hitler and other people below him ordered the construction of extermination and concentration camps. Auschwitz being one. It was built in the Annex Poland originally as a concentration camp. It was divided into three subcamps. The first was a labor camp with a sign on its entrance that said, Work will set you free. The second housed the infamous gas chambers disguised as showers that used carbon monoxide or Zyklon B to murder innocent blood and the third being another camp housing 42,000 individuals. Some people upon entering were either deemed fit for hard labor and they were automatically sent off to work or those deemed unfit were immediately gassed. Life in the camp was brutal. Prisoners were treated like cattle. They barely had enough food to eat and disease was not unheard of. Above all, maybe one of the worst aspects of the hell home was Joseph Mengele and his medical experiments. Joseph Mengele was born on March 16, 1911. He was the oldest of two other siblings and completed high school in 1930. He moved to study philosophy in Munich, where the headquarters of the Nazi party was located. But he joined the Nazi party and got a medical degree in 1938. At the outbreak of World War II, Mengele joined the Wormer in 1940. After being awarded an Iron Cross and being seriously injured, he worked his way into Auschwitz and became chief doctor in 1943. He quickly became known as the Angel of Death for his horrific medical experiments. Some people like to put experiments in quotations because it was more like torture. I've read stories of starvation experiments, the injection of chloroform directly into the heart, the seemingly random removal of a woman's calf, an autopsy performed of a still alive baby, and the genitalia removal of a bunch of young boys. Joseph Mengele liked to test on twins. He would introduce himself as Uncle Mengele to young test subjects. He would even offer them candy. Mengele's experiments on twins include the injection of chemicals into the eye to change its color and switching diseased blood between siblings. Dwarves and other people with medical anomalies were also not spared from Mengele's experiments. This sketch here from an unknown prisoner at Auschwitz depicts Mengele selecting a sick person to operate on from a line of other prisoners. Something about the inmate's ghastly expression shows us that he can't believe what's happening. And the fact that this was made by an unknown prisoner who was likely killed and became just another number in the statistic is unnerving and depressing. In all, an estimated 1 million people perished at Auschwitz. After the war, Joseph Mengele fled to Argentina and likely died in a drowning incident. There is a special place in hell reserved just for him. Okay, if you are interested in the Holocaust at all, I suggest reading the book The Holocaust Chronicle. It is a book that has a textbook's worth of information on the atrocity. 
It's not a book everyone should read, though. <laughs> Hieronymus Bosch was a pseudonym for Jaron von Aiken who was born circa 1450 AD in the Netherlands. There exists very little documentation of Bosch's early life. From what we know, he was the son and grandson of popular painters. He never wrote about himself in a diary or wrote letters. So we can't gauge what his personality was like. But he was probably a very devout Christian. Only about 35 to 40 paintings have been accredited to him, but only 7 are confirmed. Of his early paintings, they are said to be awkward when it comes to composition. One thing that does stay throughout his art is his depiction of Christian themes or Bible stories like humankind falling into the sins of lust, obscenity, and heresy, for example. What he is most known for and considered his masterpiece is a three-part piece known as a Garden of Earthly Delights, showing us humanity's descent into eternal damnation. I'm a Christian, and this resonated with me a lot. I love it. It's not exactly known when this was painted, but historians often pinpoint it to 1503 or 1504, towards the end of Bosch's life. The earliest documentation we have comes from 1517, where it talks about how it was a decoration in a town palace on public display in Brussels. Very little information is known about the painting's inspiration. The Garden of Earthly Delights itself is a triptych oil painting on oak panels. A triptych is when a piece of art is divided into three scenes that fold out. Usually, the two side panels don't play as much of a role as the center one does, but in the Garden of Earthly Delights, the two side panels are arguably the most important. Triptychs were usually used as an altarpiece in churches, and they were opened on special occasions or days. On the outside panels, there's an illustration of the third day of the biblical account of creation where God creates dry land and plant life. In the top left, you can see God the Father sitting on a throne. Above him, a quote from the 33rd chapter of the book of Psalms is engraved, saying, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Inside, the three panels depict the creation of earth and when humanity was sinless. Humanity after the fall of man falling into sin corrupting the once perfect creation and the finale being man's eternal punishment and damnation for their actions. So I'm going to break down each section starting with creation. The creation scene depicts the Garden of Eden, the location where humanity once resided. The only people in the garden were Adam, Eve, and God. You see God depicted as the stereotypical Jesus. This was meant to establish that Jesus was God in human form. God in this painting is presenting Eve to Adam for the first time, blessing them and probably urging them to be fruitful and multiply. Adam, of course, has a look of amazement at the sight of a perfect woman. Meanwhile, Eve looks away from him. There's this sort of message saying that marriage and sex is only between one man and one woman. Around them you see rabbits, a metaphor for the potential of reproduction. The tree of life is based off of a dragon tree with metaphors for the crucifixion of Christ. And on a palm tree you see Satan waiting to tempt Adam and Eve. The pool in the bottom left foreshadows what is to come with bizarre creatures emerging from its darkness. In the midground, you see a fountain of paradise, a symbol for fertility and baptism. Owls are placed all around the scene, representing the devil himself. Tortoises and other reptiles are also present, representing Satan's henchmen. This panel isn't exactly biblically accurate, though. It presents that there was always evil in the garden which contradicts the Bible. 
in all, this leads us into the next panel. In this next and biggest panel, Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit and now sin has entered the world. You see people naked, unashamed of their sinfulness. Everyone is now going after temporary and sinful pleasures. Creation is now corrupt. One of the most prevalent sins here is lust with metaphors referring to sex and stuff of that nature. Like the last panel, this takes place in the Garden of Eden. But in the biblical account, humanity was cast out of the garden and forbidden to return to it. There are several giant fish around the panel. They are out of place, just like humanity. Empty shells, corpses, and other things that are, well, empty are symbols for the feeling of emptiness one will feel when they fall into sin and wickedness. A man who seems to have taken an owl for his lover, remember the owl, shows man's relationship with sin. In the midground, a group of men riding animals that were once living peacefully in the garden are circling a group of women in a pond. Near a tent, you see a bunch of men gathered in one place. Near a tent, you see a bunch of men gathered around in one place, probably hinting towards homosexuality, which was frowned upon very heavily in the 15th century. Off to the left is a couple in a glass ball of sorts that has cracks in it, a symbol for the fleetingness of earthly delights. To tie it all together, in the bottom left, three people are hiding away from the turmoil. They are most likely Adam, Eve, and Noah. Adam and Eve are now fully aware of the consequences brought on by devouring the fruit. Just behind them, just behind them, Noah peers out from the darkness being used as a foreshadowing to punishment. That now brings us to our last and most terrifying panel. Now it is time for the punishment for humanity's actions. There is nothing natural anymore. No plants, no more graceful animals, no organic structures. Only bizarre demons from the ninth circle and man-made inventions turning on their masters. The structures burning are spires man once made to make themselves great. They are still naked, but this time with shame. All pleasure is gone now. It was fleeting. Humanity was worn, but they did not listen. They chose the wide road and are now paying for their actions for eternity. In the bottom right, a man is trying to resist a pig where nuns wear, trying to get him to sign something. This was a critique of the church from Bosch. Corruption was very, very prevalent at the time of Bosch. The most eye-catching thing is the thing described as a tree man. In him are people dining. Throughout the entire panel, demons are torturing the sinners. Bosch painted this as a cautionary tale of what happens when humanity falls into temptation and sin when they reject eternal life and salvation through Christ. And that's the final work we're looking at. So yeah, that was the video. Disturbing and terrifying heart. If you liked it, I'm glad. If you didn't like it, I don't necessarily care. Uh, you know, it. this video was uh, probably one of the darkest videos I've done. And I would be surprised if this video doesn't get age restricted. <laughs> so yeah. I thought I wouldn't get this video out before Halloween. But I did. So that's nice, I guess. And I guess you, and I guess if you're watching this right now, you're this video is probably not age restricted, so that's good. Uh I found a good iceberg uh the other night and it's something I wanna cover. So yeah, I'll see you in the next video.